Welcome to Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian communities and cults, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. Hello, my friends. Well, today is tree cutting day in my neighborhood, apparently. Someone who I assume is the utility company is going around cutting down people's trees, and it's really loud. So I must apologize if today's audio quality isn't what you're used to. I'll fix it as much as possible in post, but if you hear any weird background noise, sorry about that. But I just have to say, this is the worst tree cutting I have ever ever seen in my life. These guys are just doing an absolute butcher job. It is horrifically bad. So yeah, I have a feeling there's going to be some angry people in the next few days. I mean, trees do need to be cut back from around power lines, but this is just like jaw droppingly bad. I don't know where they found these guys. It's like the Sweeney Todd of tree trimmers out here. (laughs) Okay. On to the episode. Vampire lore has fascinated humans for centuries, starting as far back as the Greeks. From Nosferatu and Dracula to Anne Rice's interview with the vampire and Stephanie Meyer's breakout Twilight series, everybody loves a good vampire story. I mean, who could forget the hunky vampire played by Robert Pattinson with his signature sparkling skin the color of boiled pork. It would be great to be a vampire, right? Drink some blood to live forever, hypnotize people just by looking at them, avoid the crowds at Walmart by shopping at night, have an irrational fear of garlic. But way before Team Edward and Team Jacob, a much less attractive teen was taking the vampire thing way too far. I wish I could say this episode was going to be a bit more lighthearted than the last couple of episodes, but actually, this is about to get very upsetting. Some episodes of this podcast contain disturbing or upsetting topics. Use your discretion for yourself and those around you. This won't be appropriate for kids. If you feel you need support, please consider asking for help through a crisis line, a mental health professional, or a loved one. I have resources including crisis hotline phone numbers listed in the show notes. Rod Farrell was born in 1980 and grew up in Murray, Kentucky with his mother, Sandra. His father abandoned the family shortly after he was born. His mother, Sandra, was reportedly a troubled individual. She was a sex worker who also suffered from drug addiction and mental illness that included psychotic features. When Rod was still a young boy, he and his mother moved in with his grandparents, Sandra's parents, which one would hope would have offered young Rod a bit of stability. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be the case. His mother continued to struggle with various issues. She also began making claims that Rod had been sexually abused by his grandfather and other men on a fishing trip when he was five years old, and that this was part of a cult ritual. Rod may have been the victim of sexual abuse by someone. Given the rest of the story of young Rod's childhood, I actually find that aspect of Sandra's claims tragically believable. However, there's no evidence that there was any sort of cult ritual going on. But does this story remind you of anything? If you're thinking satanic panic, yeah, so was I. The satanic panic was a weird hysteria that was sweeping the U.S. throughout the 1980s. Around that time, there were a disturbing number of sensational news stories shocking the nation, in which children were telling tales of horrific abuse at the hands of satanic cults, frequently with the perpetrators being a parent, 
perhaps a father in a nasty divorce and custody dispute, or the daycare center where the child attended. But after the fact, these cases were largely debunked and found to be false claims. Children are highly suggestible, especially when being told things by a parent. These children were deeply traumatized, but as it turns out, they'd been coached to the point that they believed the outlandish and horrific things they were saying really happened to them and going into court and testifying about them. There were over 12,000 such cases, and the moral panic spread across other parts of the world and lasted into the 1990s. While the panic did seem to substantially subside, I believe it still exists. In fact, I believe there's a straight line to be drawn from the satanic panic to the QAnon conspiracy theory today. But that's another story, so let's just file that under freak out about later. The point is that young Rod Farrell at least believed that he'd been a victim of ritual cult sexual abuse as a young child, as his mother told him, and later said that his grandfather was part of a cult called the Black Mask, which had not only abused him, but also sacrificed someone to the devil. As Rod grew older, these experiences and beliefs seemed to have led him down a dark path. Regardless of the veracity of some of Sandra's claims, I think we can safely say that this could not have been a safe and healthy environment for Rod to grow up in. In fact, Sandra also claimed that she herself dabbled in vampirism, was the victim of sexual assault at the hands of a cult she was involved with, and was at one point prosecuted for attempting to seduce a 14-year-old boy, a friend of her son Rod, as part of a vampire ritual, enticing him, as she wrote to him in a letter, to become a vampire, a part of the family, immortal and truly yours forever. Ew. She pleaded guilty but mentally ill to first-degree criminal attempt to commit an unlawful transaction with a minor, which is a mouthful, but that's a felony. She was given five years probation and mandatory counseling. Life can certainly be tough as a troubled kid growing up in poverty with a difficult family life and in an isolated rural area without much in the way of resources or outlets to deal with being different from other kids. But Rod Farrell wasn't entirely a loner. He managed to find friendship with some like-minded teens with similar backgrounds. One of those friends was Jaden Murphy. He was also raised in a poverty-stricken home with a family who struggled. But Jaden had found refuge in a rather unique spiritual life, vampirism. Jaden and Rod started hanging out, and after about a year and a half of friendship, Jaden inducted Rod into his vampire house through a blood ritual they called Crossing Over. The teens met at a tombstone, which they called the birthplace and conducted the ritual, which involved cutting themselves with razor blades and feeding on each other's blood, like vampires. Another kid Rod befriended around that time was Scott Anderson. Scott lived in poverty in what amounted to a shack with plastic stretched over broken windows and a drug and alcohol addicted father. Scott would bring home leftovers from a fast food restaurant where he worked during high school to feed his younger brothers. Rod brought Scott into the vampire fold, convincing him that it was a way to escape his shitty home life. Rod also inducted two other high school friends into the vampire house, Charity Kessie and Dana Cooper. It's hard to say how exactly Rod managed to convince these other kids not just into some fun and sexy vampire roleplay, but seemingly that their vampirism was actually real and that their exchanges of blood would actually result in some supernatural abilities, even immortality, that enduring utopian idea of living forever. One thing they all had in common was coming from extremely disadvantaged and dysfunctional backgrounds. In a way, they were creating their own vampire family. At the very least, it was likely a fantasy that took them away from their difficult reality. 
There doesn't seem to be any dispute that Rod was the leader of the group that he came to call the Vampire Clan and was able to hold influence over its members. As we've seen so many times here on Failed Utopia, people are always looking for something to belong to, especially something that makes them feel special and important. And sadly, those people can become caught up in more than they bargained for. In Rod's sophomore year of high school, he had to move with his mother to Eustis, Florida, where she was relocating to be with a new boyfriend. That's when Rod met Heather Wendorf at Eustis High School. The two became fast friends, but after about a year, Rod's mother's relationship with her boyfriend fell apart and they moved back to Murray, Kentucky. Rod hated it there, and his old friend Scott Anderson described him as being different when he came back from Florida. He had a charisma that drew people to him. Remember, that's one of the key characteristics of a vampire in the lore, a supernatural ability to mesmerize and hold others in thrall, getting them to do things they might not otherwise. And he'd also gotten more extreme within the vampire fantasy world. Jaden, the friend who had inducted Rod into the vampire house to begin with, said that as vampires, they should only take as much blood as they needed to survive. But Rod wanted to take it further, saying that taking life by drinking blood would give him life. Rod had also taken on the persona of a 500-year-old vampire named Virago with abilities like reading minds and hypnotism. Jaden described being very disturbed by the last interaction he had with Rod. The two were at a party and decided to go for a walk. While they were out, a cat appeared, and according to Jaden, Rod picked up the cat and killed it by slamming it against a tree. While Jaden was horrified by the cruelty, he describes Rod as laughing gleefully over the cat's suffering, as it didn't die immediately. Perhaps we can take this story with a grain of salt, but a lieutenant from the Lake County Sheriff's Office also later recounted an incident in which she interacted with Rod and he made a remark that she believed may have been a reference to killing cats. Killing animals is a known red flag for escalating violence, which often precedes violence against people. Anyway, that was the last time Jaden saw Rod. The incident had resulted in a falling out between the two. We can probably say lucky Jaden, because being Rod's friend after that night probably wouldn't have been a good idea. Shortly after that night, back in Eustis, Florida, on November 25th, 1996, 17-year-old Jennifer Wendorf was sneaking into her house past curfew after 10 p.m. As she quietly entered the house, she passed her dad on the couch, who thankfully was sleeping and didn't hear her come in. She entered the kitchen, congratulating herself on successfully sneaking into the house unnoticed. But suddenly, she realized something was wrong. Her mother lay on the floor, and there was blood everywhere. Her 15-year-old sister, Heather, was gone from the house, and so was the family car. Jennifer called 911. A Lake County Sheriff's Office deputy was the first to respond to the scene. Richard Wendorf lay dead on the couch in a pool of blood and had likely been asleep when attacked. Ruth Queen Wendorf was found in the kitchen. It looked like she had tried to defend herself, but also succumbed to massive injuries. The deputy later described the scene he encountered as a bloodbath reminiscent of a Jackson Pollock painting. On the bodies of the victims were burn marks in the shape of a V. What's even worse to imagine than the deputy walking in on this scene is to imagine Jennifer Wendorf sneaking into that dark house and finding her mother and father. What stood out to me most from the 911 call was that despite the horrific hellscape Jennifer had walked into, one of the very first things she says on the call is, I don't know where my sister is. She's only 15 years old. 
Jennifer is remarkably composed on the call, doesn't panic even though the killer could still be there, and is immediately concerned not about her own safety in the house, but about her little sister. By most accounts, the Wendorfs were a nice, normal family. Dad Richard worked managing a warehouse for a bottling company, and Ruth was a stay-at-home mom who volunteered at the school. Big sister Jennifer was a bright, pretty cheerleader looking forward to attending college on a scholarship. Heather, the younger sister, was a little different. She had a goth vibe and was known to dye her hair in different colors, draw dark and spooky artwork, and had a Barbie doll hanging on a noose from her backpack. Now, before we go any further, let me just say that most of the coverage and documentaries about this make it sound like Heather was automatically a weirdo because of the way she looked. But in the 1990s, the goth look was pretty common, and despite the hand-wringing of older generations, it didn't necessarily translate into a troubled kid. A goth or witchy vibe was just a look that was kind of popular back then. But in Heather's case, it seems she actually did fit the stereotype to some degree and had some behavioral problems. According to what Jennifer told the police after the murders, her mother was getting fed up with Heather's acting out and some things that were going on at home. Heather had been hanging out with what parents love to call the wrong crowd, including a misfit loner named Rod Farrell, who had previously attended Eustis High School. They'd been best friends since sophomore year and had lots of fun times together, such as hanging out in cemeteries at night. But then, of course, Rod had moved back to Kentucky. About six months before the murders, one of the things that the Windorf parents were mad about was that Heather was talking long distance to Rod Farrell in Kentucky, running up hundreds of dollars in phone bills. Heather also wrote letters to Rod, describing a horrific, abusive home life. While from all outward appearances, the Wendorf family was a good home with a close, loving relationship, albeit with some conflict regarding Heather's behavior, we don't know whether anything that Heather wrote in those letters to Rod was true or not. But Rod presumably believed the things that Heather told him. He hatched a plan to drive to Florida and rescue Heather from her abusive family and bring her back to Kentucky to make her a part of his vampire family. In Rod's vision, he was the knight in shining armor and Heather the damsel in distress. Rod asked his friends Scott, Charity, and Dana to go with him to Florida and pick up Heather. Scott had a car, so off they went to Eustis and picked up Heather, then went to a local cemetery. As Scott describes it, Heather and Rod walked away from him and the other girls and were gone for over an hour. We can only speculate as to what happened during that time or what they spoke about, but when they came back, the group drove toward Heather's house. When they were about a quarter of a mile away, Scott and Rod got out of the car and walked the rest of the way to the house while the girls drove off. Scott claims he thought they were there to take Heather's parents' car. They went into the garage, and he says he didn't know whether or not anyone was home. While in the garage, Rod picked up a crowbar. They went inside the house, Scott says, looking for money. When they encountered Heather's father, Richard, asleep on the couch, Rod attacked him with the crowbar, swinging for the fences, as Scott called it. He said seeing Rod's face was like seeing the devil himself, then they saw Heather's mom, Ruth. She managed to throw a cup of hot coffee in Rod's face, but that's about all the chance she had before Rod went after her too with the crowbar. Afterward, Rod left burn marks in the shape of a V surrounded by dots on the bodies. Reportedly, the V was Rod's symbol for his cult, the Vampire Clan, and each dot represented each member of the group. The friends took off in the Wendorf's Ford Explorer and met back up with the girls. Charity, Dana, and Heather were understandably shocked when they heard what Rod and Scott had done. Heather started screaming. 
Rod was happy and giddy. Something I find odd about the manner of killing is that for all of Rod's obsession with his vampire fantasy and telling his followers about taking life by drinking blood to become immortal, the murders were just a straight-up brutal slaying with no vampire elements. There was no drinking of blood in the end. Ultimately, you do have to wonder how much any of Rod's actions actually had anything to do with the vampire stuff. After the killings, Jennifer immediately suspected that her sister's weird friends were involved. But the sheriff's office working the case had no way of knowing whether Heather herself had willingly left or perhaps had been taken against her will. Or maybe Heather was dead too, and they just hadn't found her yet. As the sheriff interviewed Jennifer, she began saying some really strange things about Heather's friends like that they believed they had supernatural attributes like immortality. Vampires, Jennifer said. Law enforcement didn't have any other leads, and they started trying to track down Rod Farrell and his possible accomplices. And as law enforcement searched for Rod, there was still that big unknown. Was Heather an accomplice or another victim? The sheriff's office soon got a lead on the Wendorf's missing blue 1993 Ford Explorer when a vehicle matching the license plate number was found abandoned in neighboring Seminole County. But when Lake County sheriffs reached the vehicle, they realized the plates had been swapped with a completely different vehicle, one whose VIN number they traced back to Scott Anderson. Now they knew to look for the Blue Explorer with Kentucky plates registered to Scott Anderson, but they didn't know where to look. Jennifer told the sheriffs that she believed they could be heading to Louisiana, so they reached out to law enforcement in that state and let them know what they were looking for. Supposedly, New Orleans was considered by the Vampire Clan to be the city of vampires, with its rich history and culture of voodoo and the supernatural, which is why Jennifer believed that Rod and any accomplices could be heading there. Meanwhile, as the vampire clan drove on, leaving the grisly scene behind, they were realizing they needed to ditch the crowbar, which, disturbingly, was still in the car. It had been a few days since the crime, and they were running out of money for gas and food. Charity made a fateful phone call to her grandmother, asking for money. Her grandmother contacted police, and authorities were able to obtain the number from which she had called, and traced it back to a payphone outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Finally, they knew which direction the vampire clan was heading. Even better, the grandmother had arranged with Charity a place for her to pick up some money, which she said she would send to a hotel in Baton Rouge. But instead of money waiting at the drop, it would be police detectives. The vampire cult was caught. During interrogation, Rod acted very strangely. He seemed lighthearted, sometimes laughing inappropriately. He also said some strange things which indicated he thought this could all be a dream and that he could simply wake up at any moment. All three girls, including Heather, claimed they had no idea that Rod was going to kill the Wendorfs, but that he had told them everything after it happened. Scott's story was that he didn't know what was about to happen when he went with Rod to the Wendorf home, and when the killing started, he froze in shock and feared that if he contradicted Rod, he'd end up dead too. When Rod's case made it to trial in 1998, the state attorney sought the death penalty, but was allegedly shooting high in hopes of getting a life sentence. I alluded to this a bit earlier, but when it came down to it in the trial, this was not about vampires. This was a brutal crime committed by a very disturbed 16-year-old boy, and the vampire clan was a vehicle for Rod to express whatever was going on with him and gain some control over these other kids. They all got something they needed out of being a part of the vampire clan. It wouldn't have had to be vampires. It could have been anything. So the prosecution focused on the crime itself, 
not the sensational-sounding vampire cult. Rod pleaded guilty, and the jury saw his videotaped confession in which he described beating the Wendorfs with a crowbar and enjoying it. The judge actually did hand down the death penalty. But the Supreme Court later overturned the sentence and reduced it to life in prison without parole. He remains in prison today. He was granted a resentencing hearing in early 2020 after the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled that juveniles should not be given automatic sentences of life without parole due to scientific evidence showing that their brains are still developing and Farrell was only 16 years old at the time of the murders. However, the judge in his resentencing wrote that after looking at Farrell's history and based on the evidence presented, the court finds that he is irreparably corrupt. So his life sentence stands. Scott Anderson maintained his story that he was present for the murders, but hadn't participated or known what was going to happen. He pleaded guilty to avoid the death penalty and was also handed a life sentence. He remains in prison today. However, in 2018, he received a resentencing hearing at which his sentence was reduced to 40 years, so he's set to be released around 2031 at age 51. Charity Kessie was given 10 and a half years in prison and was released in March 2006. Dana Cooper was given 17 and a half years and was released from prison in October 2011. Both girls were brought to trial on the same charges, so I'm not sure what accounts for the significant difference in their sentencing. One of the burning questions throughout the entire case was the role of Heather Wendorf. No one knew whether she had asked or persuaded Rod to kill her parents or if, as she claimed, she had no idea what he was planning to do. Those questions remain unanswered. But as it happens, the state attorney decided not to prosecute Heather. The Lake County Sheriff was not at all pleased with that decision, as he believed Heather should have been charged along with the other four teenagers. It does seem at least plausible that Heather had no idea Rod was planning to murder her parents. But it seems odd that she would face no charges while the other two girls, Charity and Dana, who were also not present when the murders occurred, would be given lengthy prison sentences. Heather did admit to fleeing to Louisiana, but says that she only did so in fear of her life after learning what Rod was capable of. Heather lived with her attorney's family until she turned 18. Then she moved to North Carolina, attended art school, and later married. The most recent information I could find about her was from 2006, so who knows where she is now. But back then, she told the Orlando Sentinel regarding the vampire clan, Part of it was just a game to me. I didn't take a whole lot of it seriously. It was something to have, something special in your life that you felt secret about. She also denied to the newspaper that she hated her family and wanted them dead. It's hard to square that with the letter she wrote to Rod Farrell alleging abuse at the hands of her parents. She said it took a lot of time and space for her surviving family members to heal, but that she nonetheless remains close to her sister Jennifer. Although other more recent but secondhand sources claim the two are estranged. Scott Anderson, for one, falls into the camp of people who believe that Heather was in fact the instigator and mastermind of the murder plot. But there's no way to know, since it's ultimately a he-said-she-said among the five former Vampire Clan members. We'll never know what truly drove the Vampire Clan or who knew what when. But we do know that Rod Farrell's vampire obsession an influence over his cult following of a few susceptible young people resulted in two brutal murders and the destruction of many more lives. (music) 
If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it. And if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link at the bottom of the show notes. Connect and stay in the loop on the website, failedutopia.com or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Perry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time.